most of my paints are Grubacher. Um, I'll throw in a few other ones just because of you know something I've learned. I, I picked up this peach black. The reason I like it, it's as a black, it's kind of a brownish color, whereas a lot of blacks turn blue and you mix them with white. So I like my I like most of the colors to be warm, you know, and warm means any color that would be associated with the sun, orange, red, you know, and so things like if you think about the color brown is really a really, really super dark orange, right? So it's kind of a warm color. Whereas all of your you know, things that are associated with like cold and, and not sun are the blue shades, so those tend to be the cool colors. I like to keep it, I like to keep it warm. Um, I drew in some tertials. I, I tend to just because of the type of, I, I'm better free handing as I go. Um, if I draw feathers on, I tend to, they look like scales. For some reason, when I draw, when I when I pre-draw them all, they end up looking like scales, and they look like they're just preconceived notions, <coughs> and they're just not random enough. Whereas if I just go by hand, you know, what I find out is that sometimes I, I push myself, you know, too narrow or too close, and so I have to make these, you know, as Bob Ross would say, little happy accidents. But that actually lends the bird to having some personality. And the other thing I want to say, you know, I do get a lot of, you know, how, you, know, um, you know, how do you have the patience to do this? I'll tell you, this bird, total painting, you know, I don't know what you think it takes, but like I said, I watch Pat go and do a bird, you know, pretty much almost a whole bird in a day, you know. Now, that's not fully detailed, but you should be able to get the undercoating, really. I mean, I'm willing to spend, you know, a day, this is how I like to paint. So I, I brought this mallard that, you know, I'm going to try to somewhat match the colors. This is a pintail I did a few years ago. Um, very similar, uh, very similar painting process, same thing. Um, you know, I, I was a little bit newer. Every year I get a little bit better. And so uh, there are some areas on this bird, and actually these, these underbelly feathers that come up here are probably my favorite painting of any I've ever painted. Just in the way they, the, the, the blends, how they came out. For just all people have a better side of the fish or the bird that they do. It just always seems like there's one side that you can always paint, the other one's just a pain in the butt. That's no different, you know, that's no different with me, and I, and I don't know what it is. So, um, so it, but all of the same, uh, everything was done the same, uh, the same sort of paints. And so, just, uh, just sort of start. All right, so what I have on my palette, so for white, I mixed regular titanium white, and then I mixed it with an alkyd, right? I discussed alkyds a little bit on the seminar, and I will send that back out in the email if you already have it, just, just delete it, but alkyd is a drying agent, makes things dry a little fast, but it's really shiny, right? So it does, from a decoy standpoint, you don't want one part of your decoy shiny, the next one dull. If I had my druthers, it'd all be, you know, fairly you know, I'd say sap. You know, so mad that it looks dead. That's no, no fun. So, what I've done here on my palette is I've mixed them about 60 40, and then I just pre mix them together. All right. Now, there's another thing about white paint, uh, just in general. Um, so, I do this for my whites and I do it for my blacks, and then uh, in particular because they take a long time to dry. Because in order to dry, really what oil paints do is they cure. And if they have a catalyst to cure, right, things that make them cook off faster, right, they go faster. Well, things that are dirt, made out of dirt, like the umbers, the siennas, those are made out of dirt, the earth colors. Those actually have catalyst properties, and they'll make the whites and blacks dry faster. But titanium and pure carbon don't have any catalyst to them whatsoever, so the best you get is... However, thin seed oil fast and dry, which can be up to two, three weeks, depending on the humidity. So here's another thing too about white. Pure white out of the tube is almost never any good, right? And this is true for, you know, it's it's good for highlights. You now even when I took an oil painting class last year for landscapes, pure white was saved for one spot of your choosing and no others, right? It was the the one highlight of the sun reflecting off of a mirror of a car you were painting or, you know, a, a particular, you know, ripple in the water. But other than that, 
use white sparingly. So what I do is just to make sure that I don't have anything too stark white, I start off by, by adding a little raw sienna right out of the uh, right off the top. Now I can sort of it's a little bit pink there, I'll add a little bit more. It doesn't take a whole lot, just a tiny bit, but the truth is is that when you hold it up to all of the other <coughs> colors, right, it's only it only looks darker than pure white in, in relative terms. If, if I put that white, right, so I've darkened this up with, you know, so on the palette, right, against this, it's not even a white palette. It sort of looks dark, but if I come here and I just put a dot on this decoy, look how white it shows. So, you know, white and light colors are, are purely, you know, sort of relative, right? So. And so what this does is this also gives a certain richness to the white color that you wouldn't might otherwise get. And you don't have to, you, you could use other colors too. You could use a, a lot of painters will use just a dab of burnt umber or, you know, or a little bit of raw umber. It all depends on the bird and what will help. Most hens, if you kind of look at, well, especially a mallard. A mallard hen has a lot, of, a lot of orange tones, a lot of yellow tones, and so Doing something that has a sienna, which is a reddish orange tone anyways, sort of makes sense to put in into the white. Whereas now the pintail, pintail is a little more yellow, a little bit more light. So I might not add as much, or I might use, actually what's a lot in a pintail, that, that may or may, there's a lot of raw umber in that pintail. So I might have used raw umber instead of a, a raw sienna. It, it all, you know, this just kind of depends on the overall bird. And it can change by the area of the bird. On the uh, on the mallard, you want you want things to look gradual, but so there are some areas where you know I might have added a little bit more. All right, so I'm going to paint the tail. The tail is uh, pretty much a white and what I think is a raw umber, and I'm just going to lay in. And that raw umber is lightened up. It's not it's not a pure raw umber. We're going to just lighten it up a bit and see here's the other thing is that as I lighten my colors right I'm pulling off that white right and the nice thing is, is since that white is already darkened up a little bit what I'm, I'm also getting is a blend of colors so if I use this white and continue to use this white and I'm mixing it with all the other colors that get lighter or I'm trying to you know bring something up so it's not so stark what I'm also doing is I'm, I'm kind of sharing the color. I'm making sure that that raw sienna becomes an agent that's on this bird in almost every single color by always making sure that it's part of the mix. So there's a number of colors you can do that with, but for this one here, it works out pretty good. So I have a little bit of a mixture of, of raw umber, which you know on the palette looks pretty dark, but just mix a little bit of that white makes kind of a nice dark gray color. All right, so for I usually use uh, almost always sable. Um, sable's my, uh, I really like them. They're, they're kind of my favorites. Now, I'm not, this is not real detailed. I was looking for a particular one. This one might work. Um, what I'm trying to do is I'm just going to lay out a couple of different colors and I'm just going to lay them on, you know, outside of each other in a somewhat know feather shape so on this particular decoy um, I chose to go with a kind of a light white on the outside followed by that, that, that dark gray on the inside so I just come in and I just sort of paint a feather shape and you're going to see that on here how really stark white almost this thing looks and I'm not worried about you know, and this is a part where it doesn't take like a really, really long time. I'm not being, I'm not being super careful. I'm just, I'm just kind of painting kind of a feather shape. And there's a reason I don't have to be super careful because this underpainting, you know, actually you're gonna you're gonna go back over and you're gonna blend. So I mean, I've just kind of done a little arrowhead point, right? And then I know I'm gonna bring another one. It'll come off the side. This is fairly thick. Um, I use it full strength. I use it fairly thick. You know, it's uh, 
You can do thin washes, that's what it's called when you put an oil paint on, real thin. You can paint washes to get really deep effects, but for a hunt decoy or something like this, it's probably overkill. You know, if you see my Kingfisher, that's painted in some cases five or six or seven different layers of oil paint, and each layer is really super thin. You got thinner in that paint? Nope. Straight out of the tube. No dryers. Nope, no dryers. The white is mixed 50, you know, 60 40 with the alkid, so that alkid will help set that white. Now, raw umber, because it's an earth color, it's, uh, I don't add anything to it. Most earth colors will dry, you know, overnight. They don't, you know, on your umbers. Burnt sienna takes a long time. Burnt sienna does take a long time, so I'll generally, uh, it depends. A lot of times, if I'm adding white to burnt sienna, I'll add maybe straight elegance, but uh, burnt sienna is one of those that I, uh, I'll add a little, uh, I, uh, I use cobalt dryer. Do you, you use Japan, right, Mark? What do you use for yours? Um, I guess I never read the label on mine, it's just the dryer. Oh, okay, you just, <clears throat> all right. So what I'm doing now is I'm, as I'm painting the inside of this feather with that dark gray. So far, not really rocket science. Got the one main feather, and I've got a couple feathers on each side. Now we're going to do the wet and wet blending part. And the wet and wet blending, um, there's a, different kinds of brush you can use. But I kind of like the brush, you know, I, I splay the ends because I want it kind of poofy, right? I don't need a fine pointed brush, right? And all I'm going to do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna lay the brush down, right, so that the tips are in both pieces of the paint, right, they're on both sides of the paint. And I'm just gonna lightly kind of draw that paint back and forth, flip it 180 degrees, kind of the other side. So what I'm doing is I'm picking up both sides of this paint. And it's doing a couple of things. One, it's bringing some of the light into the dark. It's bringing some of the dark into the light. All right, it's, uh, it's blending it down. It's softening it. And it's kind of creating another paint in between. Yep, this brush is dry. Now, once you start doing this wet and wet blending, we don't dry the brush. We just we wipe it off. We try, you know, we try to keep it clean. And sometimes then I come the other way as well. The reason you'll see why, because when I started doing it the first the other way, is that some of the white towards the tip sort of disappeared. That'll come right back because all you're doing is you're kind of mushing the paint. So by doing this, right, nice soft strokes, just always keeping one side of the paint and each side, right? Now this probably ended up a little bit darker, but I'm gonna go ahead and pass that around and you'll see that you get kind of a nice smooth blend back and forth. Not done yet, but that's just the initial step. Steve? Yeah. Use that base coat acrylic. That base coat, okay, we'll talk about the base coat while that's being passed, passed, passed around. All right, so that base coat, coat is Ronin's paint. Ronin is a sign painter's paint. It's just, you know what, you could use, you know, if you can get Rust-Oleum oil-based house paint, that's going to work for you. Or any other oil, you know, underneath the oils. If it's never going to see the water and sit on a shelf for the rest of your life, you can, you can undercoat it with acrylics. You can undercoat it with gesso, right? Oil painters have been painting over the top of gesso for years. Most of your, you know, a lot of your canvases today are undercoated in gesso. Uh, if you're going to use gesso, I use the Liquitex. It's probably the more expensive one, but it's pretty good. Why, you know, a lot of painters, you know, they don't paint on glass. They paint on canvas. Canvas has got a little tooth. It actually helps your eye, I think, to have just a, you know, it's fairly smooth, but just a minute amount of uh, texture. All right. So, um, as you can see, it's fairly, you know, it's fairly smooth. And then I just come in 
with one of my fan fan blenders, right? Now the again, they sell these. You know, they sell these in, for acrylic paints. They sell them for uh, you know oil paints or, or both. These happen to be sable. Uh, unfortunately, this brand Windsor and Newton stopped selling. I don't know why. I hate them for doing that. But um, I've got another one here. This is Badger Hair. Um, that's fairly soft and large. It, it kind of depends, but for the small stuff in a small area. Now what you do is you mostly you're using just the weight of the fan. You don't want to choke up on it like a pencil because that's not what you're trying to do. You don't want to be so deliberate that it looks deliberate, right? Um, you are going to create paint effects with the brush, but you want it to look natural. But you also have to kind of think, what is the angle of the barb? So the angle of the barb is just going to be, you know, it's not 45 degree angle, you know, it's, it's probably closer if you, if you were to tip it more towards 60, 70 degrees. So all I do is I just take my fan brush, I hold it at the end with hardly any, uh, with hardly any pressure at all, and I just kind of pull the paint back, right? Not too much, and I just go the other way. And what you'll notice, and, and you'll just have to now pass it around again. You get another level of softness, but the other thing you start to do is you break up, you know, that feather edge. So no feather is perfect on a bird. They're preening them, they're flying, they're swimming, they're, they're you know, they're nipping each other in the bud. So if you're to paint a perfect feather all the time, you know, it's going to, you know, it's going to look like it came out of a machine. So what this little blending does is, is it takes some of the paint that's in the area in front of it and it just pulls it back and it kind of breaks up that, that edge. The other thing that that step does for you is when you're on an actual hard edge onto a transition, right? So when you lay down your paint sometimes, you get this little, call it a little paint roll, right? Because it's kind of, it came off the end of the brush and it went up like this. Now if you keep trying to flatten that roll, all it does is keep moving to the left or the right. So you just save it, just let it be there. And, you know, if it's really large, you want to knock it down, right? But so that little tiny paint roll, that rough edge, when you come back over and, and you drag that brush, that takes care of it. The paint roll is gone, and so that's how you get. A lot of times, you get this nice smooth finish, right? So if you're paint, then you can put on an indication. So when this comes back around, I'm just going to do a small what I call an indication, where I want to put. You know, I know that the center line on that on that mallard. Right. I, I want to just, let's just say, I want to lighten it up because I want to show, you know, maybe I'm going to put in a lighter uh, uh, quill, right? Or, what am I thinking? Uh, yeah. yeah, quill. Let's say I, I want to show that it's a little bit lighter and, or maybe I'll pull something black. Or maybe I want it black, you know, and, and what I want to do is just uh, do that uh, to just add a little color. Once you get that base coat down and it's still wet, one one of my mediums. So, you know, one of the mediums I use is just called a Grumbacher Teeny Medium Number One. The reason I like it is it remains flat, right? Because remember I said I don't like shiny decoys. I like them to stay flat. So, it keeps things flat. It's made out of orange oil, so it's got that, it's got that cool orange oil smell, right? So all I would do in this case, let's just say, well, I want to put kind of a dark stripe on that rhomb or so. I put a little bit of the medium on the paintbrush, right? I'm just trying to get an indication. So it's really, it's a little bit thin and watery, right? <coughs> so what do I know about the surface tension of this is, you know, a lot less than that thick straight out of the tube I put on. So if I want, I can just come in here kind of lay in a stripe. It's not going to go in too dark because, you know, this is rather thin, so it doesn't have a lot of pigment load either. So I'm just going to try to just darken it up a little bit. Maybe I want to darken up the inner edge. All right, so sometimes maybe, you know, this feather got a little bit puffy on the one side. And I just want to darken up that inner edge, and I want to clean up the white edge. And Let's say I just want to make that feather pop. So what I do is right along the right along the white, as I come in with this thinner dark color, 
Now you can do this at the start. I could have taken out three paintbrushes and done three different colors. But this way I get to, I'm just going to define that edge. And I think even from there you can see that that makes that white raise up. Well, maybe you can't see it, but you'll be able to see it in a second. So I come back in with my blender. I kind of did a dark spot in the middle. Right? I'm just going to softly blend that in. I don't want it to disappear. I don't want it to be so stark that it just overpowers the decoy. I just want it to sort of blend in. And then I'm going to come in and I'm going to avoid the white. I just want to take that dark line along the white, darken it up. And I, but I want it to blend, so I don't want it to look unnatural. I want it to look like that that's a natural sort of shadow. Now normally I would have done that before I took the fan blender. But I don't take the fan blender again. I never heard us do that a couple times. So I'll just pass it around again, and now you'll see that that dark shadow line will push the feather that's laid over the top of it. Visually, it'll push it up. And so it'll give you that three-dimensional <coughs> effect. So that's a lot how you get the three-dimensional effect in a lot of feathers, is that by painting, you know, dark, light, dark again, and then you put something right on the edge, it'll really make it. And it doesn't matter what you're painting. Steve? Yeah? When you're doing a project, how many, how big an area you do at one time, rather than you do more than two or three feathers? Oh, yeah. Normally, I, I would have done all I just, in the interest of time, I wanted to get it. Yeah, I understand that, but I was just curious when you're doing them for you. When I'm doing them, I will try to do a major area. So, for me, you know, I would have done all of these. You know, I'd have done the tail, the under tail, I'd have done the upper tail coverts. I did one side of tertials, then the next side of tertials, then these set of scapulars, then these set of scapulars. Then I went to the under tail coverts, right, all in once. Then I did. The uh, I did to about here on the side pockets, then there, and then this here I knew was going to take me a lot of time. One, I'm painting a lot of feathers, and it's it's actually from a surface area. It's a really large area, so and these are really big feathers, so it makes it a whole lot easier. So the other thing I can do is I'm is a much larger area to paint, and then uh, I think what I'll do is I'll just pick one or two of them. I won't pick all of them. So when I look at the tertials and I look at the, uh, the colors, um, in mine I decided you know, I, I painted it kind of a, a, a dark color. That dark color to me looks like a mixture of burnt umber and raw umber. Um, burnt umber all by itself can be sometimes a little bit, you know, a little bit too brown and lifeless. And so I don't need that much. I'm going to bring some raw umber and kind of mix those 50-50. That's still going to be a little bit dark, but we start off there. So when I think of all, so my black ducks and hens and pintail hens, when I start with their dark color, right, the, the dark start, and they're usually the inner margins, Right, the inner inner forward margins of all of the feathers of most of these hens, um, you know, both with those inner markings and at the, just behind the tip, it's usually a really dark brown. So to me, that always starts off with is a, a raw umber and a burnt umber bunger mixed to give a nice, nice rich brown. But you know, I, I don't want it too stark, so I'm just gonna lighten it up just a little, little bit with a little bit of. A, a little bit of the white. I almost wish I had a picture of a, I should, I, I don't have a hen mallard mount. So when you're doing this with a hen mallard mount, you know, that would even help too. And then you can kind of pick the, one thing to note that it's funny, I, as I've been to these classes, how many guys have brought what they thought were hen birds only to be immature drakes <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> it, it's just, uh, that happened this last class. It was just so hilarious. This guy thought, swore to God he had a hand. He, and so... They actually got really nice feather patterns on those immature drapes. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, he picked it up, and the first thing he said is, this isn't a hand. It's like, what do you mean it's not a hand? It's not a hand. It's an immature drake, you know? So, I, it's, it's kind of interesting. 
All right, so on the inner side, the inner markings, the, uh, we can talk paint theory in another class. Going backwards just a second, how do you tell the immature brick? Is it the color of the bill or the... They're always on drugs. <laughs> I don't know. Either the bill or the feet, isn't it? It's the bill. The bill. Both. The bill. Well, you might go the bill. The, the bill has got a green tint. Yeah. Later on in fall. 